The year is 1848 in Orkney and a baby would be born into common life. He would stay on the island until he became a young man. Then he would travel the world reaching the Far East and America. At the age of 19, he was kidnapped and was forced on a working ship. A few prisoners made a daring escape. They washed up on the shore of a foreign island and then the natives enslaved them. This Orkney man was not going to be trapped here for the rest of his life. He was going to break free or die trying. His name was Jack Renton. The young 16-year-old Jack Renton wanted to see the world and left Orkney, ending up in Liverpool. Soon after, he enlisted with a ship heading to Hong Kong. Then Renton made it to San Francisco at the age of 19 where he waited for more work. A ship from Boston reached port in 1868. The Renard was looking to add to her crew heading to the Guano Islands. Guano or seabird excrement was at the time the finest natural fertilizer. One of the largest piles of guano reached 200 feet deep, and the work was labor-intensive, often reserved for foreigners. Jack was going to pass this adventure on, but he was drugged, captured, and forced to work on the Renard. Conditions were dreadful as the Renard was not very seaworthy, and several of the other seamen had also been shanghaied. Technically, Jack Renton was not a slave. At the end of his forced journey, he would be paid. While aboard the Renard, an older man named Boston Ned got along with some of the sailors that were tricked or kidnapped into service. Ned told Renton that he had an escape plan and already had supplies on a small whaling boat. He secretly concealed two small kegs of water containing about eight gallons. He appropriated a box of biscuits and knew where some hams could be readily got at. Each man was instructed to prepare his kits. Boston Ned hoped to make his daring escape at night when the guards were limited on deck. The only issue is they didn't have a compass and they were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. They planned on stealing a compass, but there were only two known on board. If they stole one, they would immediately have been detected. So the five men decided to leave in the middle of the night with the limited supplies they had. Some of the kit that they brought with was tobacco and some additional biscuits. But these biscuits were not normal biscuits that we eat today, they were hardtack. After they lost sight of the Renard, they hoisted their sail. With the wind picking up, they thought it would take less than a week to find one of the islands in the area. On the fourth day, the wind stopped blowing and the men began to row. They would see low clouds on the water thinking that they were islands, and after hours of rowing, the clouds would just disappear. The morale drastically dwindled with the tropical sun beating down on their fair skin. After about 10 days, the men had to begin rationing their food. Each would have a half plankton of water and half of a hardtack each day. On the morning of the 15th day, one of their numbers scanning their horizon, as usual, had detected a dark spot. Its outlines were more strongly defined than had been those of the clouds which had so often deceived them. The men rolled with all their might, going as fast as they could, and as usual, the dark spot floated up. It was a cloud. Unlike the clouds before, this cloud was pitch black. The men hoped that it would rain so they could have some water to drink, but they were wrong. A massive storm hit and the little whaling boat had to row for its life. With the rain and the winds hitting from all sides, they could not set up rain traps. Boston Ned took control of the ship and the other men held on for their lives. After hours of fighting, Boston Ned was able to keep the ship afloat. A few more days went on and all the supplies were now gone. Even the bones from the hams were crushed and eaten. Time slowly passed in the blazing sun and Boston Ed began to talk strangely. He often looked at Renton's forearms in conversation. Later, one of the Americans found a shaving razor and began to play with it. Renton was the only Englishman and he knew if people began picking sides, he would be the first one out. Ned informed Jack that he would not be a target and that he should let his guard down, but the American did not take off his eye off of Jack and the other one was unconscious and had no idea what was going on. Jack took all his spare clothing and put it around himself, even in the blistering sun. Hours went by and Jack saw something in the water. A black dorsal fin came by the boat. It was a tiger shark. Jack got all the men's attention and the sailors knew that sharks would only come this close to boats if they knew the crew was weak. The men made a decision to kill the shark. Ned got the harpoon out and the shark swam out of range. With no bait to bring the shark closer, Jack stuck his leg into the water. After some anxiety felt minutes, the shark swam closer to the ship and then turned around at the last second, just out of range. Again and again this happened. On the fourth attempt, the shark committed and rushed towards Jack's leg. Jack pulled it out the water, and Ned launched a harpoon into the shark's side, and then they reeled it down and killed it. The meat was cooked with some of the wood from the ship. Unfortunately, other sharks came and ate most of the shark. After a few days, the meat began to rot, 
and the men ate it anyways, becoming more ill. On the 35th day, Jack Renton was the only able-bodied man left, and he saw land. Jack rode and rode and rode, and night fell over the island. He was forced to stop. In the morning after, he was not too far off course, and Jack continued to row and row and row, but the waves were so tough, and his effort was futile, and then night came over the island again. On the third day, he was so tired he couldn't even row. Sailors heard horns blowing in the distance, and warships rode out to meet the men. After drifting over 2,000 miles, the first sights of humans must have been shocking to the men. The relief then turned to the fear. The men from the warships boarded the whaling ships and started to loot the remaining supplies. Then they rowed the men to shore without saying anything. So exhausted, all the men passed out and were put into a hut by the beach. Jack awoke a full day later and he noticed that their small whaling boat was ripped apart, leaving no escape. The islanders kept their distance from the white men for a while. Then a big man from another tribe came up to Jack giving him food and then persuading him to get into another boat. Jack Crinton was in far better physical shape than the other three men and was soon of interest as a commodity. He was traded to a neighboring big man called Kabu. Now as a slave in the Solomon Islands, he was expected to train the locals in his new tribe on how to create things. He tried to explain that the white man would trade items for items, but the Solomonians just couldn't comprehend. In the world that they lived in, everyone created everything. Renton was a chef for the chieftains at first. He slowly made progress doing other tasks around the island. One night, after a big ritual, he noticed that the tribe was going to make a huge raid the next day. Renton thought this was a perfect opportunity to escape, so he found a small fishing boat, some spears, and rode out in the night, looking for an English outpost on another island. Renton knew that there was some kind of outpost on another island because islanders kept asking him how to create iron. All Jack had to do was get past the next island, which was an enemy island, and he would be in the clear. He rode out at night, but got nowhere near his goal at daybreak. He was seen and caught by the enemy, and then knocked out. He woke up at the feet of Kabu. He was going to be brought back to the island where he stayed, and Jack knew that this was bad, because all runaway slaves would be killed as sacrifice. Strangely enough, Jack was spared. A huge speech was held by Kabu on the behalf of Renton. Kabu thought Jack was going out to avenge his fellow sailors on the whaling ship because just the night before they were killed by that enemy tribe. Kabu said Renton supposedly left to get revenge and that he was going to do it all by himself and that we should be so honored to have a slave like him. The whole tribe loved the story and they took Jack's slave status away and they took up arms to attack the enemy tribe. This started Jack's headhunting experience. What is headhunting? Headhunting on the Solomon Islands was a way to get spiritual power from the dead. The chieftain of the tribe would have a pile of heads next to him, near his throne or his home, and the spirits from the skulls would travel to the alive chieftain's brain, and he could use that power to his advantage. Headhunting raids and accumulating skulls was highly visible and ritualized display of their status. Chiefdoms had strong kinship ties, which gave them a good basis for maintaining political alliances. Jack Renton would lead the islanders into the many successful headhunting expeditions, bringing much power to Kabu. He was no longer a slave, but an equal learning the language from kids and being an asset to the community. He was even considered a brother to the islanders. After several years, Jack finally found that English outpost on another island and made an escape onto a ship. Kabu wasn't really upset that Jack left because he was with his own people. Jack thought he was trapped there for only a few years, but it turned out he was there for eight. He boarded another ship and returned to Orkney. His father didn't even recognize him at first, and celebrations were held in the city square for Renton, but his parents advised Jack to not go to them. He was locked away in the attic to help him cope with post-traumatic stress disorder, which nobody knew about at the time. After three days, he would return to normal life hanging out with his siblings, but he wanted to go back to the Solomon Islands. He got a job as a regular in what was known at the time as the blackbirding trade. To the South Sea Islanders, it was the South Sea slave trade. Blackbirding was a technique to tricking natives into working long contracts that were slave-like. In Australia, natives from the Solomon Islands would work three to five years harvesting sugarcane and cotton without consent and with terrible pay. This was the exact same thing that Jack was drugged into when he left from San Francisco. As a regular, he prevented other sailors from tricking natives into working these blackbirded contracts. He wanted to prevent the islanders from the same thing that happened to him. Even though regulators helped the natives, they were not always liked. In 1878, he was killed on the island of Oba when he went ashore as his job as regulator required. The news of his death reached Afula. Kabu was grief-stricken. The whole island went into weeks of mourning for Jack. 
Oral history of Jack Renton still lives on the island, and in 1963, the hut that was built in Jack's memory was burnt down. Jack Renton, the white headhunter, survived the slave trade, survived being a slave, and died protecting the future of the islanders. Thank you for reaching the end of this lesson. Claude's History Course teaches history buffs about important world history events. Become a Patreon and have your name listed at the end of each lesson. For more informational videos like these, subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Comment down below on which person or event you want to see covered next. We will see you on another lesson soon on Claude's History Course.